fledgling bird photographer in southern Indiana by Shiny Visions. The pandemic, with traveling to faraway places on hold and the cold of winter upon us, we work from home and stay home to shelter from the virus. Is staying put and fighting stir craziness our only option? Enter Bob Wren, a longtime leader and mentor of the Photography Club. Let me show you some cool places around here for bird photography, he said. For years as a passionate nature photographer, Bob has scouted locations nearby in southern Indiana for catching great views of many types of birds. Having never photographed birds before, I still jumped at the chance to leave the house and look at something other than my backyard. First destination was Lake Monroe, the largest body of water in Indiana, located 10 miles southeast of the city of Bloomington. On a clear, windy, cold day, I observed members of the photography club bundled warmly to brace against the chill, surveying the choppy lake waters. They stood in readiness behind their long lens cameras that were secured onto sturdy tripods. Looking for what? Though there were lots of seagulls about, it was the elusive loon they searched for. While loons look like ducks, they are not. They are water birds, but have pointed beaks and legs located farther back on their bodies, making it challenging for them to walk on land. This day, there was one lone loon swimming, then disappearing headfirst into the water, then reappearing a distance away. The strong winds ruffled his feathers and water droplets sat in perfect balls on his oily plumage as he fought against the forceful water. Apparently, loons are fierce fighters and protectors of their young. In 2020, a dead bald eagle was found floating on a river in Maine with a dead baby loon near its talons. The eagle was fatally stabbed in the heart by a loon's beak, likely speared by the baby's mama. This loon is displaying its winter plumage. In the spring during mating season, it looks completely different sporting a dazzling bright patterned coat of feathers. With my fingers frozen and face numb from the cold and shivering on that boat dock, I caught the contagious enthusiasm of fellow photographers as they excitedly pointed to bird sightings. I was hooked. I too wanted to photograph birds. Our next bird excursion was near Seymour, Indiana. Bob posted photos of sandhill cranes and announced that they had returned to the farm field south of Seymour. Several members headed there to photograph these birds and we wondered what all the commotion was about. We drove to this area and witnessed the commotion for ourselves. We discovered hundreds of sandhill cranes foraging in harvested cornfields, their loud calls resounding across the flat terrain. They ate, trumpet called, and leaped up while flapping their wings in shows of dominance. Groups flew in V formations across the blue sky. Their landings looked awkward, even comical, with their spindly, twig-like legs dangling downwards, toes spread wide like sticks ready to drop. For takeoffs, these four-foot-tall birds ran vigorously, flapping their five-and-a-half-foot wingspans. But once airborne, they flew gracefully and majestically. Sandhill cranes stop in this area for rest and refueling during their winter migration to warmer climates like Georgia and Florida. They are omnivores, eating by sticking their beaks into the ground and rooting around, oftentimes leaving dirt on their faces. Next, we were introduced to Stillwater Marsh located between Bloomington and Nashville, Indiana. This seasonal marsh is one of the region's best wildlife management areas. The water levels are controlled throughout the year and corn is planted for birds to feed on, creating an optimum habitat for migratory birds and other wildlife. We learn quickly that for good bird photos, it takes patience, perseverance, and toughness in adverse weather. But it pays off. There is such a variety of birds at Stillwater Marsh. Teal wing ducks reveal bold teal blue color on their upper wing feathers while flying, thus the reason for their names. They are common in sheltered wetlands and usually feed by grazing or dabbling, which is feeding by dipping their heads in water to search for food. 
They nest on the ground, near water, and under cover. Ducks use flat bills to strain food from the water, but northern shovelers take this feeding process to another level with their large, broad, rounded bills. Flocks of shovelers often swim slowly together, their ample bills just skimming the water. Frequently, they swim in shallow waters with their heads partly submerged and their bills swinging side to side to help strain food. It's their primary method of feeding. Canvasbacks are large, big-headed diving ducks and are very social during the non-breeding season. Their large webbed feet and bills are perfectly adapted to dive into the water to feed on vegetation below. Those bills are also well suited for digging in the muddy bottoms for occasional snails and clams. Redhead ducks forage for food by diving, usually in water a few feet deep or by dabbling in very shallow water. They eat aquatic plants, seeds, and insects, and on rare occasions, fish. Usually, they lay 9 to 14 eggs, but actual numbers are difficult to determine. That's because some rascally younger, inexperienced redhead females lay their eggs in other species of ducks' nests, especially the canvasbacks. This sneaky behavior causes other birds to do all the work to hatch those ducklings. It's a detriment, however, to the unsuspecting nesting bird because it reduces the survivability of their own eggs. Northern pintail ducks dabble on the surface of the water, using their bills to filter out foods like insects and seeds. They feed usually in the evenings or at night, reserving most of the daytime for rest. Northern pintails' long necks enable them to forage for food at bottom depths of up to 12 inches, the farthest reach of any dabbling duck. They also waddle at the edges of wetlands and through farm fields feeding on grain and insects. Mallards are one of the most abundant ducks in the world. They eat mostly plant food by dabbling in the water or grazing. However, there are reports of mallards eating frogs and small birds too. Common golden eyes are aggressive and territorial and have elaborate courtship displays. They feed on mostly foraged underwater aquatic animals and insects. Their breeding habitats have been impacted by pollution and deforestation, causing common golden eyes to be placed under international conservation agreements. Today, their populations are stable. American widgeons feed by dabbling for plant food or grazing. They also eat food that requires diving into deeper waters. But the catch is, they don't dive. These clever American widgeons are sometimes called poacher or robber ducks. On the water, widgeons often hang out with feeding coots and other diving birds. Once the nearby diving birds bring up the forage food, widgeons sometimes steal it. Widgeons also commonly feed on dry land, eating leftover grain in harvested fields and grazing on pasture grasses. Having a largely vegetarian diet, most widgeons migrate south earlier in the fall, well before marshes begin to freeze. Ringneck ducks are strong and fast flyers. They can practically do vertical takeoffs from the water, unlike the laborious takeoff runs of most diving ducks. Despite the name, the ring on its neck is oftentimes hard to see. They mostly eat a vegetarian diet with some insects and mollusks. Greater scop populations have been declining for the past few decades. They have rounded heads, which may be the best method for distinguishing between the greater and lesser scops. Lesser scops have peaked shaped heads. Behavior and breeding wise, greater and lesser scops have a lot of similarities. They both form flocks that number in the hundreds or thousands sometimes. These giant groups can be seen side by side on the water, but they hardly intermingle. Their diets are also similar. Wood duck populations were in serious decline in the late 1800s because of habitat loss and hunting, both for meat and plumage for the ladies' hat market in Europe. After protective measures were taken, they are rebounding nicely. Coots are not ducks, only distant relatives, though they live typically in wetlands and can be found among ducks. They are migratory birds and have been found as far south as Panama and as far north as Greenland and Iceland. Coots eat primarily algae and other aquatic plants, but also small animals when available. 
This little pied-billed grebe almost became lunch for a bald eagle who was hunting overhead, but the protective uproar of squawking and flapping from the birds around it deterred the eagle, and he retracted his talons and flew away. The bald eagle, the American emblem, seriously declining in population during much of the 1900s, they have made a comeback in many regions. Bald eagles look majestic, but their feeding habits are oftentimes not. They eat dead animals and steal food from ospreys and other smaller birds, but they are also skilled hunters. Eating mostly fish and other water animals, they can adeptly swoop down and snatch prey with their talons. Then there was the Belmont Rookery in Belmont, Indiana, where great blue herons live. These magnificent four-foot-tall birds with six-feet wingspans are spectacular to behold. They live in colonies, which is evident in the 30-some nests in this cluster of trees, and eat primarily fish from the nearby river. Their specially shaped vertebrae in their necks allows them to quickly strike prey from a distance. The best time to see great blue herons is in March or April, because the leaves on the trees have not yet filled out to impede viewing. That is also breeding time. The males select a different nest each mating season and then try to attract a female. To impress them, they stretch their necks up and point their bills skyward or fly in circles above the colony with their necks extended. The most attractive move, surely, is when they stretch their necks forward, head and neck feathers erect, and then snap their bills shut, the clapping sounds reverberating through the trees. A female great blue heron will lay two to seven eggs. Likely, the time these babies are born will be just the time the leaves fill out, hiding the nest and their residence. Somehow, I think that was exactly how nature planned it. Finally, there's Goose Pond Fish and Wildlife Area. In 2005, this 9,000 acre property was purchased and set aside for marsh and prairie habitat. It has become one of the largest and most successful wetland restoration projects in the United States and a popular destination for birders. There's a large observation deck behind the visitor center and hiking paths that wind through the marsh and meadowlands. Sandhill cranes fly in each spring as well as snow geese so numerous they darken the sky. The rare whooping cranes, red-winged blackbirds, egrets, killdeers, as well as many other species. After living in southern Indiana for so many years, we never knew that these beautiful locations existed just a short drive from home. Seeing and learning about these stunning birds as well as how to photograph them was a treat and such a welcome distraction from the monotony of the pandemic life. Our thanks to Bob Wren and the Bloomington Photography Club for helping to keep us sane through such a challenging time in the world. For more information on the photography displayed here or about the club, go to the website shown here. Please subscribe to this channel and my website shinyvisions.com for more adventures both close to home and far away. This is Shiny Visions.